Well, good evening, River of Life. It's not super fair to make me emotional and then have me come up and have to preach. That's not super nice, but appreciate you very much. We appreciate your generosity. We love, 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 love this church and can't imagine being anywhere else. And uh, we're just super grateful for um, just the people of this place. I, I say it all the time, but I truly mean it. I believe that we are family at this church. And, uh, and so uh, you all mean a great deal. Some of you I've just met recently, but if you choose to call this your church home, I want you to know you are welcome, you are loved, you are part of our family, and we take that uh, very seriously because it is a serious thing. And so I just, I do want to thank you. I know some of you are wondering why, why Hunter didn't come up here and why Nikki isn't up here and maybe Angela isn't up here. And, uh, and we are, they are working towards becoming pastors at this point. And uh, so that will eventually come, but we will still honor all of them uh, in, the, in the months to come here. So don't, uh, don't worry, we will take care of them as well. And, and they, we have an amazing team, uh, amazing team that God has brought to River of Life. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you haven't been with us over the last few weekends, we've been in a series that we've called Through. And, uh, and so we, this is week three of that series. And um, in the opening video, we, we see Psalm 23, verse 4, and it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's pray. God, in the next few moments as we look at your word, I pray, Father God, that you'll illuminate it for us, that, Lord, you will show us what we need to see, that, God, you will, you will uh, speak right into our situation. Whatever our situation is, God, we, we trust you today. Lord, we know that, that our country has walked through a very difficult week figuring out leadership and all of those things, and, and Lord, whether that's over or not over, I don't know, but I do know this. No one voted on you. You are in control. You are always on the throne. There is no chance of you ever not being on the throne. And so, Father God, you are our hope, and so we put our hope and our faith and our trust in you, and we do give you all the praise. God, I thank you for those who are watching in Wyoming, and I praise you for those who are watching in Alaska, and, and Lord Jesus, we praise you because you are opening doors in other places for us that are bigger than us, and so, Father, we just thank you, and Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to continue to be faithful with what you've put in our hand, and Lord, as we do that, I know that you'll expand it, and you'll make it even bigger, and we do praise you for that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So over the last few weekends, as we've opened with this video, I've... I've explained it to you, because if you're new and it's your first weekend here, maybe you haven't seen any of this series, uh, you may have noticed that the word yay, which is in the King James Version, which is Y-E-A, uh, I changed it in the video a couple of times to say yay, Y-A-Y, and I've explained it over the last few weekends. We don't typically change scripture in this church, so don't get worried. It's not, that's not like a habit of ours. I, I put it both ways in there, but because I wanted you to understand that I believe that for us, as we talk about walking through a valley, when we're truly trusting God, when we really have come to a place where we believe him, we take him at his word, we know that he is with us, then we can eventually get to a place where we change the Y-E-A to a Y-A-Y, saying, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Anybody in the house there yet? Okay. Honesty. I like honesty. I'm not there yet either, but I'm working on it. Uh, depends on the valley that you're walking through, and some of them are really difficult. And so I don't know about you, but I want to get to a place where I can say, yay, another valley. Yay, hard times. And as we walk through this series, the reason that we should be able to get to that place is we can come to a new understanding that when we do walk through a valley, it's because God is teaching us something Amen. and he's bringing us to a new place. And we can't get to the mountaintop without going through a valley at times. And so uh, we've talked about that over the last few weeks. We've talked about a few things that will keep us in the valley, things that will stop us from moving forward. We started by talking about doubt. Then we moved on and we talked last weekend about hurt. And many of you have even talked to me a little bit about that since then, about the fact that you have been in a place where you've been hurt by something, you've been hurt by a loss, you've been hurt by, by somebody, you've been hurt by a scenario or a situation, and you've chosen to camp in your hurt. And God has never intended for you to stay in your hurt. He wants you to walk through it. He wants you to get to the other side of it because there's a mountaintop waiting for you. 
Some of you have camped out in the valley of guilt. You've placed yourself into a place where you are guilt. You feel guilty about your past. You feel guilty about things that you've done. And because of that, you don't move forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm just telling you right now, his blood is enough for you. His sacrifice paid the price for you. So you don't have to live in that valley anymore. He's already paid the price to move you out of the valley and move you to a mountaintop experience. So don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that you're so guilty that there's no way that God could ever use you or could ever love you because it's absolutely not true. So today I want to talk to you about a valley that we find in Joel chapter 3. It's the valley of Jehoshaphat. Listen to this. It says this, proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war, wake up mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around, because your mighty ones, uh, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge the surrounding nations." So what's happening here is the prophet Joel is saying this is what needs to happen, and out of that we see that it's a call to war. In other words, it's a call to action. They're saying, he's saying, God is saying, you guys need to rise up. You need to stand up. Now is the time for you to go and to make a difference. And so as I was reading that story again this week, I was brought to this understanding is, or the understanding that um, we, are, we can live in a valley of indecision. We live in really hard times. We live in super difficult times. We live in times right now where we as the church have got to make a decision. We've got to decide what side we're on. Will we stand or will we sit back and watch? See, in this story, that's exactly what's happening. They're saying, God is saying, you need to stand up. You need to prepare. Let the weak say, I am strong. So maybe you sit in the house tonight and you feel weak. You feel beat down. You feel not strong enough. And so you, you, you sit back and you go, well, someone else can fight this battle for me. And I'm telling you right now, God is saying, let the weak say, I'm strong. And let's take a stand and let's be the church that God is calling us to be. Many believers are stuck in this valley of decision. They are unsure of what they stand for. You allow the wind of your circumstance to move you hither and fro. You, you allow any, any given perspective from any person to change the direction that you're going. And God is saying, I am calling you to the valley of decision because you need to move forward. You need to stop listening to every other voice and you need to start listening to his voice. James 1 verse 8, King James Version says it like this. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I like that version. I also like the uh, NLT version which says this. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they are unstable in everything that they do. So what is that saying? It's saying when we can't make a decision who we're going to follow, we are unstable in everything that we do. So if you live in this space, in this valley, in this place where you just don't make any decisions because you're so afraid you're going to offend somebody. Oh man, if I, if I, if I talk about Jesus, I might offend my unbelieving friends. If I stand up for what is truth and what is right, it may be offensive to somebody. And so because of that, we try and please both God and the world, and we please neither. And God is saying, don't be indecisive. It's time for you to make a decision. We are in a season where the church needs to rise up. We need to make a decision to say we are believers in Jesus Christ. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And sometimes that's going to be offensive to the world. And don't get me wrong. Don't be offensive just to be offensive. Some of you just like to argue. This is not a call to arguments on Facebook. 
okay? This is a call to stand for truth and what is right with love. Some of us forget the last part of that. With love is how we show Jesus. Because Jesus confronted, but he always showed love, right? So as we look at this, I think sometimes our inability in our lives, our uh, instability, sorry, in our lives comes from the lack of ability to make a decision. We try to have it both ways. We want what the world has, but we also want what God wants, and that's not how it works. Listen to this, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20 says this, so Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to, the Mount, to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Why are you silent? Your fear of making the wrong choice your fear of offending someone, your fear of ruining a relationship because you're standing for something. You're wanting to have it both ways, and so you sit silent. And Elijah said, listen, why are you silent? Make a choice. Either follow God or follow Baal, but at least be man enough, woman enough, to stand up for something. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. Didn't they do a good job with the notes this week? If you're, if you're Nikki and Seth came up, they're doing a great, great job. I appreciate that. So if you, if you don't know what we're doing there, you can follow along on the app. Uh, there's sermon notes, and, and where those bold words are, that's a fill-in. So you can just kind of remember these notes. You can then email them to yourself. Daniel 1 verse 8 says this, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested uh, of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So I want, the part I want us to look at for just a moment is Daniel purposed. He did things on purpose. See, if we're going to follow, if we're going to not get stuck in this valley of indecision, then we need to understand that it comes when we purpose within ourselves to do what God's calling us to do. When he's calling us to stand up, when he's calling us to live righteously, when he's calling us to be people who look like him, it only happens when we do it purposefully. When we make a decision inside of ourselves that says, I am going to follow Christ. I am going to look different than my coworkers. I'm going to look different than my family that doesn't follow God. For men in the, in the house right now who are the leaders of your home, it only happens when we're purposeful about the way that we lead our home. Single moms in the house, it's purposeful in the way that you lead your children. You got to be purposeful in the way that you do it. It doesn't just happen by accident. It doesn't happen through osmosis. You don't come and listen to the bald guy and all of a sudden it just everything changes and you're, and you're just doing... No, you have to be purposeful in the way that you walk this thing out. Some of that happens as we mature in our faith. So how do we mature in our faith? We mature in our faith by spending time in God's word, by digging into what his word says about us. And I can't say this enough. You hear me say this a lot, but, but it's so important in our journey with him that we read his word and we understand what he wants from us and what he has for us. It's not a book of just rules. It's actually a book of promises. And so when we, when we, when we read a promise, what we need to understand is oftentimes there's a thing that God will say around a promise that says, this is what I want for you to do. And out of that, when you're obedient, I have this amazing promise for you. Yeah. Now, it's not because he's in this, like, he, we have to trade things off, but it's because he's the one who created you. So when we read this book, it's our owner's manual, right? Yeah. Like, if you, need to know, if you need to know something about your car, you go to the owner's manual and you look, maybe not, maybe you just go to YouTube now, but you, you used to go to the owner's manual and, and you look it up in there. Why? Because the person who wrote the book made the car. So they know it. 
So when we look at this, it's our owner's manual. We need to trust and go, okay, God, I want to become mature in you because I believe that, that you're calling me to action. And so out of that call, I want to be who you're needing me to be. We've got to come to a place where we stop trying to please man and we start understanding that we were created to please God. So the next valley that I want to take just a few moments and talk to you about this evening is this. It's the valley of dying dreams. Some of you have a God-given dream that now to you seems dead. Now, I'm not saying to you some of you have a God-given dream because all of you have a God-given dream. Whether you've discovered it yet or not, I don't know that. But if God's laid it on your heart already and you have set it aside you've assumed that it isn't for you or this isn't the time or the season or whatever the excuse is, I wanna wanna address that this evening because I believe that so many of us buy into a lie that the dream that we maybe one day felt God had for us is dead and we need to just put it aside and not think about it anymore. And then we get stuck in a different kind of a valley. See, hell will always try to steal a God dream. Most people give up on the verge of the greatest opportunity. Let me explain that. I believe that there are many people who, as you begin to walk out a God dream, God lays something on your heart. It's a ministry you're going to start. It's whatever it is, whatever he's laid on your heart, you begin to walk that out, and then things get hard, and they get really hard. And a lot of times I'll watch as people will quit in that moment. And what happens is typically you're quitting right on the verge of your mountaintop. You're walking through a valley and you feel like the valley's never gonna end. And so you get to that space and you give up thinking that you're never gonna get to the other side. Everything you want is on the other side of not giving up. Ooh, that was good. And and April, I'm glad you're with me tonight because (laughs) so good that, that you heard it. I think everybody else in the house didn't hear what I just said. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it, right? Everything you want is on the other side of not giving up. So you're really close. We have a, Shannon and I have a dog. His name is Kobe. I put his picture up here. Uh, that's Kobe. Um, Kobe's a cute little dog. He's blind. And uh, so he, it makes life interesting for us. We take Kobe for walks up at our house, and he's an interesting dog because he gets so excited. If you say the word walk, he just goes crazy. He's barking. He'll jump all over you. He'll scratch your legs all up. It's great. We love it. <laughs> and then we take him out, and we go for a walk. And as we go for a walk, he will, he, because he can't see, he can only feel where the road is. So he, his walks are like three times longer than Shannon and my walks are. Because he goes like this, like across the road. He'll go from one edge, he'll hit the gravel, he'll go to the other edge, he'll hit the gravel. And he loves going on walks, but what happens oftentimes is because he's walking so much, before we can get home, and he doesn't know where home is, he can't see it. So before we get home, he'll get too tired and he'll just sit. (laughs) And especially if you put him on his leash, then he's like, I'm done. You want to put me on a leash, you can just carry me because I'm not doing this. We put him on the leash because we're thinking, well, we can, we can guide him and save on, on his mileage, right? We can, we can save on his steps for the day. But he doesn't understand that. So you put the leash on and that dude will sit down and you can pull that leash and he'll just keep his butt on the ground. But oftentimes what will happen with him is especially when it's summertime and we take him for a walk, you can tell he's getting tired and he needs water, and he's panting, and he's struggling. And so many times, we will literally be at almost the top of our driveway, and he'll stop, and he'll just sit there. And we're trying to, like, come on, Kobe, we're home. Like, he understands what we're saying, right? Like, we're having, like, conversations with him, trying to coax him into coming with us. Um, and, and, but, but we're telling him, we're here, man. You made it. You, you've arrived. You, you did it. Good job. And he just sits. And so oftentimes we'll have to pick him up and carry him uh, into the house uh, to his water bowl, which is what he wants. He wants his water bowl, right? And I was thinking about that this week as I was thinking about this idea of so many of us being so close 
to what God has for us, but oftentimes we just sit our butt down and we sit there not getting what we need. He's sitting literally steps from a door that will open that will have exactly what he needs, the refreshment of the water that he so longs for, but because he doesn't understand, he sits. And because many of us don't understand that we're so close to the refreshment that God has for us, we're so close to having that thing take place inside of us that will change everything for us, we sit. And we sit. And we sit. And some of you have been sitting for a long time. So much so that maybe it's even hard when you come in to a house like this tonight and, and worship is going and you see people participating and, and diving in and, and you just feel dry. You feel so thirsty, but you can't drink. You feel hurt. So you sit. And God is saying, you're almost there. You're almost there. Keep going. Keep going. You're almost there. You've almost made it. Why are you stopping in the valley? I have a mountaintop for you. Unless you can endure the valley, you will never experience God's dreams for your life. This goes back to what we were talking about last weekend when we said the valley of hurt is where life springs from. When God puts a dream in your heart, the valley will come. Why? Because the valley is often the pathway to our greatest victory. See, the valley is necessary. It's the valley of dry bones, but when our hope is and our trust is in God, then he brings those bones to life. Here's the thing. God's given many of you dreams that you know about already, things that maybe you've already begun to pursue or things that you've set aside because you feel like you're not eligible to do them. Whatever your reasoning is, can I tell you that oftentimes the reason we have to go through a valley is because God wants to know if he can trust you through the trouble. It'd be great. It would be awesome if God just, you know, laid it. We get, we get people that go to the Dream Center. They'll come back. God will have spoken to them while they're there about a ministry, about something that they feel like they're supposed to do. And they'll come back and they want, man, they want, they want, us, to, they want us to have a special board meeting so that we can buy a building for them so that they can start this new ministry that, they're, that they feel called to. And they don't understand that that's not a, a how it works. Um, <laughs> But they, what, I, what I always know is that if God's laid a big dream on your heart, he's going to walk you through a valley of trouble, of pain, to prepare you for the dream. Yeah. He wants to see, can I trust him through the trouble? You see, Satan will always send a valley when he sees that God has a dream for you. Yeah. Oh, amen. God allows the trouble to come to teach you and to mold you but it is also a vote of confidence from your creator. See, God sees you and he's like, oh yeah, she's got this. Oh man, he's gonna do it. I know he's got the ability to do it. I know he's got it in him. We're gonna send him through a little bit of a gauntlet of some trouble here and he's gonna come out the other side stronger. Your trouble is your pathway to your triumph. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Satan said, we will stop you. We will nail you to a tree. And when Jesus stepped out of that tomb, the dark valley became the pathway to the dream. Yeah. See, Jesus himself walked through the valley. He made a bold statement. He said, God's dream is that the church will be built and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yes. And Satan said, oh yeah, we'll nail you to a tree. And Jesus said, good thing I get the last word. But you see, the valley had to happen for the dream to be fulfilled. Some of you need to hear that tonight. 
The valley had to happen for the dream to be fulfilled. It makes the triumph that much bigger, right? If every time God laid something on our heart, we just got it, just happened. Oh, God placed a dream in my life, and now, you know, he, he dropped a, a $10 million check in my lap. We bought a building. We're doing this thing. It just, everything's just clicking, Pastor Jason. It's so amazing. Never once heard that once ever. <laughs> and it's not because God can't do that. He absolutely could do that but you wouldn't know what to do with it if he gave it to you right now. He's saying, you got to walk through some trouble so that you understand the triumph. God will give you a dream to stretch you, to give you something to strive for. See, the valley is about self-discovery. Who are you really? You figure that out when you're in the valley. The mountaintops are great, but you really figure out who you are in the middle of the valley. Your identity cannot be found in what other people think or say about you. There are some that you need that because we live in a time right now where I think more than any time in my lifetime, people are so worried about what people have to say. And where do we see it the most? We see it on social media. Oh, I got a post and I got, I got you know, 2,000 likes. It was amazing. Oh, I'm so, you know, and, and we get our value in that. Even though we understand how unhard it is to like something on Facebook. Like anybody can just think like. I mean, I, I watch people sometimes where they're like on Instagram and it's like, dee, 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 dee. they're liking everything. Like, oh, you posted, I like it. That's great, right? It, there's no value to it. It doesn't actually mean anything. Oh, I didn't get likes. Oh, man, did I upset somebody? Is somebody upset? And, and our, our value is based on what other people think about us. Yeah. And God is saying, listen, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you through a valley because I want you to understand where your identity actually is. And when you're in the middle of the valley, when things are at your lowest, who's with you in that space? Who stands with you? Who forgets about you? Who isn't there and who is there? And those are things that we need to pay attention to. And then as we look at this, we need to know that God is the one who said, though, though you're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. Amen. The valley is also about God discovery. You will find out more about your relationship with God in the dark times than you ever will in the sunshine. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 12 said, the Lord said that I would dwell in the thick darkness. You see, you can learn about God in the dark places. You were never intended to stay in those dark places because he will always lead you through them, but he can reveal his character in a new way when you're in the dark times. A benefit to the valley is that when you get through it, it will shut the devil's mouth. That's why he so badly wants you to stay camped in the valley. As long as you stay camped in the valley, he can keep talking. But when you listen to God's voice and you get through to the other side, he actually sees that he has no control. Can I tell you that oftentimes we feel like, well, if I'm in a valley, it's because I've done something wrong. And don't, sometimes, that, sometimes that may be true. Maybe you've chosen to make bad decisions and you put yourself into a bad space. But if you know that you're doing your best to be obedient and to follow God, then you will still find yourself in a valley because, again, God will use those hard times to prepare you for something great. Yeah. We see it with Joseph. Joseph endured the pit and prison to get to the dream that God had for him. See, none of us want to be in the pit and none of us have any longing to be in prison. But out of that, Joseph became a leader. He got put into a position of authority that no one could have seen coming. But it happened because he was put in the pit and prison first. You need fresh fire, fresh encouragement. Why do we push to get people to come to church, to get involved in small groups, to tie into ministry, to come to the building? Because when you isolate yourself, you give the enemy a chance to speak things to you that are untrue. 
And you may be watching online right now and going, oh, yeah, but I'm hearing the word, and that's great. And it, if you need to be at home, then please, that's, that's fine. But I'm telling you right now, there's something about coming together. There's something about worshiping together. There's something about encouraging one another. And it's so important because I believe now more than any time in my lifetime that we are walking through a season that is harder on so many of us at the same time. Usually as a pastor of a church, you'll see members of your congregation who are like, oh man, we're going through a hard season. And you talk to someone, oh, it's a good season. Right now, it seems like most everybody is like, it's a hard season. So what better time for us to be together and to encourage one another? You're having a good week and they're having a bad week, then I'm going to encourage you because I'm having a good week and and we're going to just be together. It's important. I want to say this again. Don't let other people's opinion become your reality. You are always going to have the naysayers in your life. As you begin to press in and you begin to call to God and say, God, will you, will you give me a dream? Will you show me what it is that you have for me? And maybe you're in the house right now or you're watching online and you would say, you know what? I don't know what God's dream is for my life. Can I tell you, here's the thing. He wants you to know it. He's not a God that's going to hide it from you, but he wants you to want it. So so my encouragement to you is is to spend some time praying and saying, God, what is your dream for me? And and buckle up, because if it's a God dream, it's going to scare you. You know, it's not, you're not going to pray and go, God, what is your dream for me? It's that you will attend two services a month at River of Life Church. (laughs) Some of you, that'd be a big improvement. But um, (laughs) okay, moving on. Um, It's going to be bigger than that. It's going to be something that that maybe you've never even thought of before. In fact, most of the time when God places a dream in your life, it's going to be something where you're like, I don't know if I actually heard from God there. I've heard people that are like, oh, God called me into the ministry, and I don't know what, why he would call me. I'm like, well, I'm guessing that's really a God dream then. Yeah. God, God called me to go and, and, uh, and uh, quit my job and to do this other thing, and, 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 and I don't know, and, and it's big, and it's scary, and I don't know how, but when it's a God dream, it's going to be that. Yeah. Why? Because then you need him. So I want to I want to close in just a moment with this. But in Genesis chapter twenty one, we see the story of Abraham, and Abraham so desperately wants children that uh, while he's waiting on this promise that God has for him, he he ends up um, sleeping with one of his uh, servants, Hagar, and they have a child together named Ishmael. And then we see God's promise fulfilled, and Sarah uh, has a baby. And and as time goes on. Sarah becomes jealous and is like, I don't want Hagar and Ishmael around anymore. We need to get rid of them. I don't want them around our kids. I don't, I don't want, you know. And so, so Abraham reluctantly gives Hagar some supplies and sends her into the wilderness. And so as we look at this story just briefly, we see that, that Hagar is now in the wilderness and she's running low on supplies. She's out. And in Genesis chapter 21, verse 15 It says this, when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. When she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away, I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what is wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard your boy crying as he lies there. Go to him. And comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled the water container and gave it to the boy to drink. I want to look at this story for just a moment because God had given a dream for Abraham's descendants that he would build a nation. Now, Hagar steps away and she finds herself in the wilderness and she's out of everything that she knows how to do. She, she's done. So much so 
that she takes this baby and she's like, there's no hope left. So she gets him as comfortable as she can get him and then she goes 100 yards away so she can no longer hear his cries. And she sits and she weeps. She said, it's over, it's done. And God hears the cry, not from Hagar, but from the baby. And says, I've heard the cry. Go and take care of him. Pick him back up again. For some of you, what you need to understand is Hagar understood that there was a dream, but to her, the dream was dead. The dream was over. So she left it said, I'm going I'm to have to get as far away as I can because it just isn't going to happen. But God heard the cry from the dream. He said, the dream's not dead, Hagar. Go pick him up. Some of you needed to hear that tonight because God has placed a dream inside of you. And you have you've set it aside. You've said, I'm getting too old to do it now, or I don't have the resources to make it happen. That's what Hagar thought. She thought, I don't have the resources. Ishmael's gone. He's dead. And I'll be soon after. But God said, no, no, no. Pick him up, and I'll show you the resources. Pick him up again, because I have the resources. I have what you need, but you got to pick him up. Some of you found yourself in this valley of dying dreams. You're in a space where you feel like there's no way, there's no hope. God could never use me. I've made too many mistakes. I've done too much stupid in my life. So there's no way that God would ever. And I'm telling you tonight, God is saying to you this evening, pick that dream back up again. I have the resources. When you pick him up, I'm going to show you. He's not dead. I'm going to make a nation from him. A mighty nation. I wonder how many things we've left for dead that are actually a mighty nation waiting to happen. I wonder how many things we've dropped and left to the side of the road thinking, well, God, I must have misheard God on that one. I'm challenging you tonight. I'm challenging you to pick it back up. Trust him. Don't get sidetracked. See, here's the deal. The enemy loves it when you allow your dreams to die. He loves it when God gives you something and you assume you can't or you allow everything else to become more important. Well, someday when I have what I need, maybe I'll be able to. And God is saying, chase what I've told you to chase. And everything else will be added to you, the Bible says. Seek first the kingdom of God. Oftentimes we seek first all the other stuff and what we have left over is what we give God. And then we wonder, why is this so unfulfilling? Because we're doing it backwards. God has dreams and plans, but he's going to bring you through a valley. But guess what? We can start saying, yay, to the valley. Because we understand now that he's bringing it through us, not because he's mad at us, not because he can't stand us, but because he loves us so much that he's saying, I'm going to prepare you Because this dream is big. This plan is overwhelming, but you're going to get it when you go through the valley. You're going to understand it. When we planted this church, we walked through a very hard season in our lives. Some of it, I believe, was the enemy attacking us, trying to stop us. But some of it was God training us. And I look back on that valley... And I can say, yay, because I see what God was doing. I didn't say yay while I was walking through it. Still working on that. But I can say yay now 
because I see how good my God is. And he says, I have a dream, but you're going to walk through a valley to get there. I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes with me. This evening, I believe that there are many in this house who you are stuck at a, a, a valley of indecision. You found yourself in a place and in a time and in a season where you feel like, I don't even know how to move forward from here. I don't know, I don't know if I want to go all in with this relationship with Jesus or if I'll just kind of be lukewarm sitting over here. I don't mind going to church. I don't mind listening to that bald guy talk. And I don't, I like the music. It's really good. But that's about as much as I'm going to dive in. And I'm telling you right now, that's a horrific place to be. You got to make a decision. You got to choose. What are you doing? Are you going to follow him? Are you going to listen to his voice? Are you going to allow him to be the lead in your life? Or are you just going to keep walking from side to side of the street like my little blind dog? You might get somewhere eventually, but you'll be a lot more tired. Tonight, if you're in this valley of indecision, I want to give you the opportunity to make a decision. So if you're here tonight or you're watching on live stream, my question to you is, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you listening to him? Are you trusting him? He has such good things for you. So if you're in the house tonight and you just be honest with me and say, Jason, I have not been following Jesus. I've been making my own path. I've been trying to, to force my way forward. But I want to follow him. I want to know what that's like to put my hope and my trust in him. If that's you tonight, whether you're in the house or you're watching at home, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Even if you're at home watching this, I'm going to ask you to do this as well. I'm going to ask you to just lift up your hand and catch my eye because, I, well, you can't catch my eye on live stream, but lift up your hand and, and just as a sign that, God, I, I need this. Yeah, I see you, man. Yeah, I see you, buddy. Is there anybody else in the house that would just say, Jason, I want, to, I want you to remember me in this closing prayer. I want to make my relationship right. All right, I see you right there. Thank you. All right. Yep. Okay. Good job. Take one more moment. Is there anybody else that would just say, Jason, will you just remember me in this closing prayer? I want to I want to follow Jesus. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I feel like I need to wait one more moment. Is there anybody else that would just say, Jason, will you remember me in this closing prayer? Yeah, I see you. Anyone else? Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to ask everybody to repeat this prayer with me, whether you raised your hand or you didn't. Maybe you didn't have the courage to raise your hand and you know you need to make your relationship right with God. We're going to pray this prayer together, and it sounds so simple, but it's, it's this amazing moment where you go, God, I, I'm in a valley, and I'm, I need to hear your voice and not only do I want to hear it, but I want you to lead me through because that's who you are. And as we pray this prayer, we're going to talk about the forgiveness of our sins because the Bible says that when we ask, when we choose to follow Jesus and we ask for forgiveness, he removes our sins from us. It's the biggest miracle ever. So I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And I'm deciding today to follow you. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to become what you want me to become. Give me a God-sized dream. And help me to pursue it with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. An amazing thing happened. You started a journey with Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you're perfect, trust me. It just means now you're listening and you're believing and he's going to speak to you. He's going to show you things inside of you that he, that he sees when he sees you. 
For some of you in the house, we're going to close right now, but maybe you're in the house and you, God's given you a dream and, and I just couldn't help even as I was putting this together, feeling like there are so many of you that have set your dream aside. You've said, no, I, I can't do it. I've made too many mistakes, whatever it is, and you've left it to die. And God is saying, pick it up and move. He has what you need. He has the resources. He can do the impossible. But you've got to do your part. So if that's you, I'm going to ask that it, our, some of our prayer team members will be down here. They will, they will pray with you. They'll wear masks and, and they won't touch you, but we'll pray still. And we'll just believe that God is going to do something incredible inside of your life. Whatever your need is, whether it has to do with a dream or something else, we'd love for you to take the opportunity to come and have somebody just agree with you in prayer. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you have plans for us. We thank you that you are a God who brings us through. We give you all the praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We